Okay. So thank you again for the recording. I'll say thank you for joining us today, uh, May 10th, 2023, for Hold On To Your Hats. And we're going to talk about the Harbor and Tributary Study. And we have some wonderful panelists here today. Sarah, I'm sorry, I cut your picture off here, but you're here too. You can introduce right. yourself. I'll, I'll let you do your, your introduction. Um, so I can give quick bios for our other speakers. So I've got Mr. Clifford Jones. I'm going to read off my paper because my speaker notes are not showing. Um, Cliff assumed duties as the chief of planning division, New York, New York district in January, 2016. The New York district is responsible for the Army Corps water resource development, navigation and regulatory activities in Northeastern New Jersey eastern and south central New York State, including the New York Harbor and Long Island and parts of Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. That's a lot. The planning division is responsible for preparation of decision documents for water resource studies, including plan formulation, economics, and environmental analysis. Mr. Jones began his career with the Corps in 1988, where he was a project planner in the planning division at New York District, and executed, completed, and executed and completed the first cost-shared feasibility study with New York State, Long Beach, New York. Since becoming the New York District Planning Chief, he has shown exceptional knowledge of the planning program and process and has helped this district to achieve many milestones within the study process, including many within Hurricane Sandy's portfolio. Um, Mr. Jones holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Ocean Engineering from the Florida Institute of Technology. And I'm going to go on with our other two speakers. Dr. Utka has more than 26 years of experience in program project management, in addition to his engineering project experience. He managed multidisciplinary engineering projects, including coastal storm risk management, resiliency, climate change, hydraulic coastal engineering, dredging, dredged material management, modeling, and flood protection, primarily in the Northeast U.S. He is currently managing Baird's USACE New York District contract as the prime contractor, which includes the HASC task order. HATS task order. <laughs> um, he served on the governing board of the Coasts, Oceans, Ports, Rivers Institute of ASCE. Mark Jaworski has more than 25 years of experience in planning, design, and construction of shoreline restoration, protection, and resiliency projects, specializing in the effective applications of natural and nature-based solutions. His background includes obtaining environmental approvals for the development of large infrastructure projects in the New York and New Jersey region, including New York Harbor. His expertise extends into preparing NEPA documentation for marine and ecological restoration projects, including environmental impact statements, environmental assessments, and categorical exclusions. His technical expertise also includes sediment investigations, dredged material beneficial reuse analyses, treatable, treatability studies, and the environmental remediation of contaminated sites. Mark has successfully completed numerous ecological assessments, fish, fish passage assessments, endangered species surveys, tidal and freshwater wetlands restorations, and has participated in the development of two regional wetlands mitigation banks. Finally, Mark manages several coastal and riverine projects as part of the coastal storm risk management endeavors being undertaken by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and other federal agencies. And Sarah, you're on your own. <laughs> Thank you, Medea. Well, Thank mine's you. not as impressive, so I will keep it simply to I am um, Sarah Swickla, a vice president at Stantec, also part of this planning committee um, on the um, New York City SAME Post and the New Jersey SAME Post, and really happy to be here today with our impressive speakers. So thank you to Marat, Mark, and Cliff. Um, so um, just so everyone here understands our run of day here, um, 
we're going to have a few presentations from Cliff um, Marat and then Mark. Um, then we're going to be opening it up to questions and answers. You'll see in the bottom of your screen that Q&A spot. So please put your, your questions in there and we will um, get through them after we see all three presentations. Um, I do want to note um, and just thank to the thank you to the core and also to Baird for this really extensive public comment period that they did with hats. Um, so you, normally it's a shorter period. They extended it and extended it again when they saw how much interest had come from the from general public and how impactful this project was going to be. And it, it's really been extraordinarily well received um, from the public at, with the the level of engagement they've had. Um, but also, I will say with that extension, you know, we set this up a while ago, and then the comment period kept getting extended. So um, I I, I um, hope you all understand here that their um, level of insight into the breadth of the comments. Uh, might not be as great as we thought it would have been when we um, scheduled this early on, thinking the comment period would have ended in January. But with it just ending at the very end of March, there's still a lot of work to do to digest all these comments. So um, I'm grateful to you all for being here today. And with that, um, Cliff, I'm going to put it over to you. And then Cliff, you can simply move it on to, to Marat and Mark, and then I'll jump in at the end with some questions. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thanks everybody for participating and attending. Um, yes, we're here today talking about the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. Um, and as you said, Sarah, we, we've extended the public comment period. And even though the public comment period is over, um, we're still doing uh, briefings like this one. Um, and I'll say, as the Colonel would like to say, uh, one, he, he, he wanted to be a part of this, but uh, had, had other commitments, but he says, uh, basically, if there's a grandmom out there that wants to have a conversation with us, we welcome the opportunity. Uh, so although the comment period may be over, there are still opportunities like this one to uh, brief out and explain what, what the process is uh, moving forward and explaining what it is that we're doing. Um, so with that, I mean, the New York, the, the New York and New Jersey Harbor uh, and Tributary Study, aka HATS, uh, was born out of uh, Hurricane Sandy and the efforts that were started um, and realized through the NAC study, the National North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, um, that this was a vulnerable area that needed to be uh, focused in on. Uh, so we put out uh, reports uh, in this last draft report that went out uh, for public comment, uh, agency comment uh, and review and here today, basically not to go over the, the whole report and what it includes, but more so on the process that we've gone through, uh, the comments that we received, and what, what's our pathway forward. Um, we'll give you a brief refresher. Uh, I'm assuming that many of you have either, either read the report or ha have been involved in the briefings, but we'll give you a little bit of overview and some of the lessons that we've learned. Uh, next slide. Um, so one of the things that we, we like to say right up front, uh, the important things to note as we move on, uh, while we're in the process here and we put out the draft report with our tentatively selected plan, um, that plan is preliminary and conceptual. Uh, what, what you'll hear in the, what you'll see in the report, what you'll hear from us, uh, the details are subject to change uh, based on new information and based on all of the feedback that we've been getting through the comment period. Uh, so there's a lot of work still to be done. Uh, we, we've not yet approved anything or, or been funded by the Congress to, to actually implement anything or actually even design anything. So we're still in the planning stages. Uh, basically, everything that we talk about here is a summary recapping of what we've done in the report and the Tier 1 EIS. Um, the, the link to our report is shown below. Uh, basically, once you, if you Google anything with New York, New Jersey hats, uh, you'll definitely come up with the page that, that's included in there. There's a lot of information in there, including a, uh, a storyboard, story map of what happens in any particular area. So a lot of information, and I encourage everybody to, to go and check it out if you haven't already. Um, next slide. Yeah, again, uh, showing you the directions to the draft report um, and all of the appendices that, that accompany that report. And as, as I said, the, the story map that accompanies that report as well. 
um, that, that contains the information, which has made it a lot easier for people to digest what's in there, read at their own pace. And as Sarah had mentioned before, getting enough time for people to absorb all of the information that's in there and, and summarize it in a way that we can to make it a little bit easier for folks to, folks to, to, to read, understand, and digest all the information that's contained in there. Uh, next. And so here is just basically what we came up with. So the, the report itself um, and all of the analysis that went into the report looked at many different alternatives. Um, and based on the alternatives, some of the induced risks by putting in some of those uh, alternatives, uh, we landed on this one alternative 3B as the tentatively selected plan. Again, if, if you, you need more information, and we, we do have some backup slides if we wanted to get into uh, the description of this alternative specifically, uh, but this kind of sums it up uh, right, right here. Uh, it sets itself back a little bit from the, uh, the, the, the gates uh, that, that are more ocean uh, bound, uh, where, whether from the Verrazano or even further out from, from the uh, Breezy Point and Sandy Hook. Uh, areas, but sets it back in a way that there's still uh, two, two and a, almost two and a half miles of storm, sur storm surge barriers included in that. Um, there's a lot of features uh, still on the shoreline uh, for areas that aren't addressed by the storm surge gates, um, and there are induced flooding uh, mitigation features. So where the, the gates might cause uh, induced flooding in, in the areas surrounding it, there, there are proposals to address those areas by, by having uh, complementary features uh, to address that. And then risk reduction features. So areas that still would have uh, residual risk with the project in place, we, we propose to uh, attack those areas in a way to give those certain features uh, to reduce the, the flooding in those areas, uh, which also, even with the gates in place and closed, uh, or a, a, when they still be open, would still need to be um, uh, complemented with risk, risk reduction features to address the uh, sunny day flooding or uh, uh, sea level rise that might might occur uh, in the uh, coming years to address those uh, flooded areas. Um, total cost of the project uh, is looking to be $52 billion. Yes, that's billion would it be, um, but that is the uh, protection of the entire New York, New Jersey area. Um, that saw just about that that amount of money um, from the results of Hurricane Sandy alone. Uh, so a lot, lot of uh, work still to be done with this. And again, details are provided in that uh, story map and, and, and in the draft report, uh, but we could get into details if we, if we needed to on that. Uh, so next slide. All right, and here, here's where we went to, uh, kind of where we started and where we're going with all of the opportunities moving forward. So we're still in the planning stages and we started this planning study, feasibility study back in 2016. Uh, the, one of the first things that we did right from the gate was had a scoping meeting to bring in all of the agencies uh, to get uh, what their concerns might be and how we laid this out. And basically one of the agreements right from the start was that we knew we weren't going to be able to address everything within this feasibility um, and address all of the impacts specifically. So the tier one concept was laid out to make sure that we had an opportunity to get the concepts built into the planning stage uh, to get a recommendation and then have a tier two to more specifically get into um, the, the designs and, and the, the impacts uh, that would happen with a recommendation like that. Um, so with that, we, we, we marched forward and in 2019, we put out an interim report. That's not, normally not a part of our process, but that interim report gave the agencies, the public, our partners, um, an understanding of what the alternatives that we were considering and the different impacts and the different benefits the different costs of those uh, proposals might be. Uh, unfortunately, some of those, uh, as those report, reports went out, um, the, the focus got to be on some of the largest scale 
uh, proposals that were in there. Not not necessarily that we had proposed anything, but the uh, the intent was uh, to address the problem in a way. Um, but that report went out and it got feedback so, such that uh, shortly after we, we were suspended uh, from funding for, for this study. Um, and not, not until uh, 2021, we actually got back into uh, the funding and in 2022 last year we were able to get a draft report out um, and that draft report is the subject of what we're talking about today and we'll get into some of the bucket list of uh, comments that we received and where we where we go from there um, so that that's the process we're at right now and we're looking at right now in 2024 to have the chief's report signed but being that we were suspended for uh, almost two years, uh, we'll have to somehow make up that time. And with all of the comments that we received, we're looking at uh, potentially having more time uh, and more funding needed to address the comments and really get into some of the optimization that we need to do uh, to get to that chief's report. So uh, I'll put an asterisk on that chief's report in 2024, more to be determined uh, on that. And then the, after that chief's report is signed, uh, we're looking forward to having uh, pre-construction engineering and design, which at that time will include that tier two uh, EIS. And then after that period, hopefully we get to a point where we can actually start construction. And that construction, uh, that'll really be the point where we uh, determine during the, en the, the pre-construction engineering and design, but leading to construction, uh, what are the opportunities to uh, prioritize projects? Uh, how can how can we get to the uh, if you want to say easy projects or the the low hanging fruit uh, while we're still designing and refining the the, the larger complex parts of this project? Um, okay, on that uh, next slide. And our schedule is laid out here. Uh, basically, as I talked about, the the main points being uh, we, we we just uh, closed the comment period. Uh, reviewing the comments. Our next uh, milestone really is to, um, excuse me, the lights went off, um, is to hit our agency decision milestone. Uh, and we're targeting July of this year to hit that. And that's really the point where we as, as, the, as the agency, uh, Corps of Engineers, we determine with our partners, uh, is this the viable solution, uh, the recommendation moving forward? Uh, noting all of the comments that we've received, how are we gonna move forward, making sure that we can address the comments and move forward towards that chief's report. Uh, so hopefully we can hit that agency decision milestone and continue the work that we've been doing. Um, and then, like I said, after that, we, we, we complete the tier one part of the EIS and the chief's report. And then uh, hopefully the, the next steps get to be the authorization. Um, and then we can hit tier two. Uh, next slide. So just getting into what we've done here, and this was a, a massive uh, undertaking for the comment period that we had, we recognized from the start that this was gonna be a little bit more controversial, needing more time. Uh, we initially put out the draft report at, with the understanding of 60 days just to start us out. Um, the, the immediate response from uh, many, including our partners, uh, was to push that out. So first extension, uh, became uh, 6 January, which was 91 days uh, getting into uh, the, the beginning of the year. Um, then shortly after, we got uh, another request, whether it was from congressionals uh, or, or uh, lo local uh, par partnerships uh, leading to a 7 March extension, allowing for an additional 60 days and getting to uh, our last extension, which was to get it to 31 March. Uh, so the total comment period ended up being 175 days, um, different from our typical 45-day review period. And that definitely understands that th this is much more complex, much more wide area, uh, comprehensive than in any other study that we've undertaken. So it's been a great uh, process. And I think we've got a lot of feedback that what we've done simply by extending is good enough. But the extent that we've gone through to incorporate 
uh, many of the local municipalities, the, the communities, uh, the community boards um, ha has been well received. And, and we've gone out quite a bit to make sure that we were targeting and hitting all of the areas, uh, if not exclusively, but uh, including the environmental justice communities to make sure that we had a full complement of uh, participants in, in that review process. Next slide. Um, and as far as insights, so what, what, we, what we've gained, what we've learned, kind of uh, that, that public comment period roll up, like I said, it was, it was very extensive. In, in addition to the time, we had 23 public meetings, 60 in external engagements, just going out to communities, just having virtual uh, coordinations, um, not necessarily entire public, but massive amounts of engagements um, with, with the, the communities, the, the, the extent that we did to translate um, the, the public meetings, having translators on board, having the flyers translated into six different languages, um, trying to, as I say, meet the public where they are, uh, trying to gain the insights and gain that trust from each of the communities that we are there to represent their interests and get their feedback. Um, and and tar targeting and try, trying to get as well from the states from the cities, um, where are the environmental justice uh, communities that we should be reaching out to? And we, we did a lot of coordination uh, through that as well. And I, I believe that we, we did uh, a very well uh, job uh, on that outreach. Um, and this is something that, that I think uh, leads to what we'll do here for this study, but definitely expands into uh, the broader context of how we do studies in general and the needs that are gonna be included as we scope out future studies, including study budgets uh, for the additional cost and time for in increased public engagement, specifically with environmental justice communities. Next slide. So going uh, again to that, so our robust communication strategy, again, to try to, try to reach out because of the complexity of this study, but as well lessons learned here as to how we're gonna do uh, studies in the future. And for this one, our communication strategy, uh, like I said, the, the, the um, site that's online that includes that project story map, uh, includes uh, the, the, the virtual engagements, uh, translators, uh, recorded presentations, so, so we didn't have to go out as many times, but we could, we could use out those recordings. Um, and each time we went out to communities, it was daytime, evening, weekends, wherever people needed us to be, we were there. Um, lever leveraging existing and establishing new relationships uh, to get the word out. And a lot of support was given from our partners from New Jersey, New York, New York City, uh, non-governmental organizations, community groups, and academic institutions to help us along the way to get this word out and improve our, our, our access to communities. Next slide. And, and here we, we kind of sum up our lessons learned. And I guess at this point, I'm gonna kind of turn it over at this point to Marat uh, to go over uh, what we've learned in this process and uh, the comments that we received, and we can get into some of the uh, the thoughts on those kind of bucket list of comments that we received. So at this point, Murad, you want to take it over? Yes. Thanks, Cliff. I hope everyone can hear me. I can. Yes, we can, Murad. Great. Okay. So there were basically three lessons learned outcomes and what work uh, that came out of the communication strategy and the public outreach process that Cliff talked about in the last couple of slides. And then first is the, how these meetings are organized. The, the best way to engage with people at local level and not overwhelm already overburdened communities is participation and engagement that were organized by the local leaders uh, through separate meetings. Uh, and second, of, uh, second you know, developing a comprehensive list of environmental justice leaders at the local level was the second point. And there's an immense lift required for these meaningful public engagements underscored the need for the, uh, the district to do this work and, and building relationships with these leaders will improve future engagement on the project. 
And last but not least, experienced team and hefty logistical support is essential to a successful public engagement. Uh, budgeting, planning, and for such expanded public outreach, especially when the study areas include these underserved communities, is not a, a trivial task, as you can imagine. And careful planning can lead uh, to more efficient and cost-effective engagement, naturally. Uh, with that, I think we are going to move into uh, the, the review process and snapshot of the comments uh, that, you know, sort of an overall summary this slide shows. Uh, naturally, the, 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 the typical Army Corps review process includes various levels of review, where HATS uh, has, you know, also passing through right now. These processes include, as summarized in the slide, there's a policy and legal compliance review, and we'll, the Army Corps already received about 61 comments there, which are being addressed as we speak. Uh, there's a North Atlantic Division Quality Assurance Review. That's a standard process. There has been, you know, 35 comments received there. And partially they've been addressed and still working on those responses as well. Uh, the Army Corps also has an agency technical review, which is called the ATI review. There's you know, more than 100 comments there being addressed uh, along with the other comments that we're talking about here. And there's also a, an independent external peer review of the whole process or so whole uh, reports that, that we've submitted there. And that's also in process. I think that's the last step in all of these uh, Army Corps processes that we are going through right now. In addition to Army Corps' own uh, review process, there's also the non-federal sponsors and partners a part of this project. They include state of New Jersey, New York State, as well as uh, New York City. And they issued a, a joint letter, uh, as you see, that dated 23rd of March uh, of this year, uh, the, as well as they have their own comments that they provided to Army Corps. They, they're also under being consideration as we speak. In addition to the non-federal partners, there's also cooperating agency comments that was received. They, they include EPA, uh, National Park Service, US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as NOAA that we received. Last but not least, uh, of course, there are public comments and there were more than 2,600 comments has been received and maybe even a process of, I guess, getting some more. Let's talk about uh, these, you know, building off these engagement start as part of the internal report release. So, and let's talk about what those comments are and whom, whom the Army Corps engaged. As Cliff also mentioned uh, earlier, you know, there were a lot of uh, communications with the elected officials, local governments, non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, as well as private entities. And uh, this, uh, the, there were over 80 meetings as, as Cliff mentioned, and I think they're still counting because we are still continuing with some of those meetings, including this one that we are having today. There were, as, uh, there were 23, 23 public meetings that were all in-person, virtual, as well as some of those meetings were hybrid. And this, these meetings were held throughout the study area. They were not concentrated in one area. Uh, and then there were stake, 60 stakeholder engagements. There was one hybrid, 10 in-person, 49 virtual. And some of those were hosted by elected officials, local governments, and non-governmental organizations. And that process started in, way back in September uh, after the report was issued. Again, you know, continuing to today. On the right, you see some of the copies of those, you know, images of those brochures, meeting advertisements, and other public information materials. They were in six languages. And on the right images that you'll see some of the media outreach and some of the uh, other virtual meetings, uh, as well as you know meetings with the Congresswoman Velasquez down at the lower corner there. Uh, again, let, let's you know go into uh, some of the details of the public comments received so far. Again, as I mentioned, there were more than 2,600 comments received from you know elected official, local governments, non-governmental organizations, you know universities as well as private entities and individuals. I think that's also important to to mention here. Uh, Here's an attempt to break down as the, these comments were compiled uh, and the Army Corps was able to you know, break down is by team. So and the, the graph on the side shows a percentage of those you know, as listed on this list as well. So uh, starting from the flooding, there are more than 800 comments there. It's about one third of the entire comments uh, list that was related to flooding. Uh, overall study questions were about, you know, again, about the same, close to 800 there, about one third of the entire comments there. There, of course, uh, 
uh, comments that Mark will talk about some of the environmental issues, NEPA process there. There are environmental impact questions about 700. Environmental justice was also an important part. Again, Mark will mention those uh, in, in the next couple of slides here. There were you know, more than 400 engineering comments, more technical. Of course, general meeting information concerns, there were more than 250, about 10%. Some technical comments as it relates to sedimentation, water quality, more than 150 there. Post construction operations always, you know, an important issues, and there was more than 100 comments there. Uh, sea level rise is, of course, an important element of the project, and as well as the storm surge, there were about 100 comments there. Navigation impacts as we build these storm surge barriers, of course, and some of the gates will have an impact on those and there were questions about those as well as the benefits as it relates to penalty growth ratios and the cost of the, the project itself. Uh, as if you're counting, of course, you'll see or, or notice that the, the total will be above 100% here, all these comments. That's just simply because some of the comments uh, are, are included more than one team. So they were, and that's how it's counted. Maybe we'll go into a little bit more of the details of what those main teams are. Uh, I have uh, some more details about that. I think 10 or 11 teams that, that I just talked about. So one of which was the public engagement on plan more forwards and for the disadvantaged communities. Uh, there's a need for further agency and, and more engagement. And there were a number of comments as it relates to those engagements. There's also uh, comments on the need for a greater incorporation of uh, natural and nature-based solutions, which is called more green solutions, as well as the non-structural me measures, which of course will be a significant part of the optimization in the next phase. Uh, and there were comments on the need for you know, more refined, more detailed environmental impact analyses. Uh, there are different layers to that, as Cliff also mentioned, uh, and especially of the water quality and ecological impacts from the surge barriers. Uh, going into to next theme, so there's also comments on the need for greater integration of proposed structural measures into existing neighborhoods and water fronts to imp impacts on aesthetics, view sheds, and recreation. Naturally, you know, some of these will, will impact those. Uh, solution is this 3B uh, tentative for selective plan will, will have some impact there. So it's been, you know, there were comments regards to those naturally. And the concerns for remaining areas with existing coastal storm risk unaddressed by the current plan features. As you've seen from the figure, there are unaddressed areas with this plan due to multiple reasons, but there are, you know, significant comments there that be not addressed for those areas. Uh, there's, there's also comments on the request for evaluating the more combined flood risk in interior drainage. Uh, and issues that may be caused by the rainfall and you know fluvial fluvial impacts coincided with the coastal storms. Uh, the next set here is probably the last set, I believe. Uh, of course, there's a need to, to accelerate the implementation. There were comments in regards to the implementation of the plans. It's going to take a long time needed in design and construction. A tentatively selected plan actually has the 14-year time frame here. Uh, that's certainly uh, uh, you know time time frame to be cognizant of, uh, and also the less complex feature as quickly as possible on high flood prone area. So there were some comments regarding to how quickly some of those can be implemented. Uh, there's also environmental issues, you know, concerns that advancing the plan the construction may be delayed or stopped due to the hazardous toxic radiology waste issues, lack of landfill sponsors support. Uh, congressional uh, authorization, which has to go through right after the chief support, as well as funding issues were, were among some of those comments. And the last two are, you know, the concerns on the future prioritization and sequencing of the construction. Uh, that's still being developed. I think we are still in the early stages uh, for some of those details, uh, but that's also, you know, a significant part of the, the next step here. And the last but not least, the you know the concern of regarding the funding and assurance that the plans features will be properly operated and adequately maintained uh, in the future. Naturally, operation maintenance, maintenance as well as how these gates, you know, especially the large ones, the surge barriers are operated, is, is a significant concern to many, and naturally an important elephant of the, the project. Uh, so these were the main teams. And the next, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to. To Mark, so he's going to talk about the, some of the EJ uh, issues as well as the NEPA process here. Go ahead, Mark. 
Okay, Marat, thank you very much. I think my video is still loading. So many of you who uh, who know me know that HATS is a very important project. Um, I live along the Jersey coast uh, in a community that was devastated by the storm, including the death of my next door neighbor during the recovery process. So uh, these are very important. This is a very important project that affects a large number of people uh, and a number of uh, number of communities throughout the, the New York Harbor region. So I'm going to talk a little about the environmental justice uh, process, how it was performed, and I'm also going to then talk about the NEPA process and the next steps uh, going forward there. So um, a notable comment regarding environmental justice that was received during the scoping and interim report review periods was a request for more comprehensive environmental justice and other social effects analysis. In coordination with the state of New York, the state of New Jersey, and the city of New York mayor's office, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers prepared a preliminary analysis on other social effects and environmental justice, which is being found in Appendix A-12 of the feasibility study for additional detail. In the other social effects analysis, Vulnerability factors considered included, but were not limited to low income poverty level, the elderly, the young, the disabled, female heads of household, and several other social criteria. From the other social effects analysis, the vulnerability factors relative to environmental justice communities were cons consolidated and compared to the environmental burdens provided in US EPA's environmental justice screening and, and analyzed by census track. And this is an online screening tool that EPA had developed for uh, this type of uh, analysis. The results of the assessment found that the recommended plan at 63% of the census tracts within the study area meet the criteria for disadvantaged communities, and almost every segment of the recommended plan touches these communities. While some of the low impacts are expected in the disadvantaged communities from the construction and operation of Alternative 3B, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers anticipates those impacts can be mitigated for and that the overall recommended plan would largely have a beneficial effect as more vulnerable portions of populations would have reduced risk from flood damage and from related flood uh, contamination. The Army Corps of Engineers is looking to refine the analysis going forward with feedback from stakeholders in the study area as there's always room for improvement of environmental justice analysis and communication. Next slide, please, Marat. So uh, regarding environmental compliance, um, as many of you know, the NEPA or National Environmental Policy Act requires federal agencies, including the Corps, to consider potential environmental impacts of their proposed actions and the uh, reasonable alternatives before undertaking the federal action or constructing a project. There are many environmental laws shown here regulations and executive orders that the Army Corps of Engineers must demonstrate compliance with in the NEPA process. So these would include the, the NEPA regulations, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Natural Historic Preservation Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, and the other acts that are noted, including the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Next slide, Marat. So the Council on Environmental Quality provides uh, for three types of NEPA analysis based on the significance for impacts. Based on the complexity and scale of this study, the project study team is preparing a tiered environmental impact statement, which is the most in-depth type of NEPA review occurring in two separate tiers. A tier one environmental impact statement, which is prepared for the feasibility study, involves a technical analysis completed on a brand scale on broad scale that is therefore an effective method for identifying existing and future conditions and understanding the comprehensive effects of the project. It provides a groundwork for future more detailed environmental and technical studies, modeling, and agency consultations. As mentioned, the Tier 2 environmental impact statement will include subsequent detailed analysis in the form of an environmental uh, impact statement as the recommended plan design becomes more refined and further assessed during the pre-construction and engineering design phase. So what we see here um, in reading the EIS prepared by the district is that there's an initial screening of several uh, resources, which we'll discuss next. 
identifying whether those resources um, are at risk of impact, and then identifying whether there's additional uh, analysis, uh, modeling, or, or um, investigation needed to further quantify that impact. And that would be done under, under tier two. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Marat. So if you look through and read the environmental impact statement, these are the resources that were uh, natural resources and man-made assets that were evaluated in tier one. So it's extremely comprehensive from, from uh, marine manual, mammals, wildlife, and marine fish through uh, ports and waterways, uh, energy infrastructure, public uh, spaces, uh, school, uh, and national uh, historic landmarks. So this was a very large scale comprehensive analysis of the resources in the region, and then identifying whether which ones were at uh, risk of impact, and then those would be carried through, as I mentioned, in tier two. Uh, next slide, Marat. So this uh, environmental plan comparison and potential mitigation uh, the takeaways, um, all, and all the alternatives have an impact, even no action, no action being that no, no, no treatments are, are uh, installed. So you still have in, in uh, large scale flooding incurred, uh, releases of contaminants, uh, loss of power to wastewater treatment plants um, and other types of, uh, of impacts to both natural and man-made uh, resources. Um, so the impacts also are in, uh, determined based on whether they're in water or on land. Obviously, in-water uh, infrastructure is going to have a greater impact on uh, migratory uh, anatomous fish, marine mammals, and other, uh, other uh, marine organisms, where on land, um, it would be more of a terrestrial type impact, but still an impact nevertheless. Um, the environmental impact statement also identified that there's benefits associated with each of these. Uh, alternatives uh, based by have, having um, uh, uh, in-water structures that can provide habitat if properly enhanced, um, and also through um, improvements to uh, the built out asset world, such as airports, energy uh, facilities, and uh, uh, the ability for people to get back and forth to work and to uh, go to school. So there's also been benefits that are associated with each of, each of the alternatives. Um, an important item here is that um, the core regulations, they stipulate that the recommended plan must contain sufficient mitigation measures. So the plan will have no more than a neg negligible net adverse impact on fish and wildlife resources in addition to other assets. So that's a, um, a very important um, item that's being addressed uh, and will be addressed in more detail as the EIS process continues. But in order to start the conversation on mitigation, a uh, conceptual mitigation and monitoring plan was developed for the Integrated Feasibility Study Tier 1 EIS, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's found in Appendix A10. So that's uh, um, just the start of a dialogue, which I'm sure uh, the natural resource uh, steward agencies and, and the general public and uh, the non-governmental organizations will have a big uh, part of. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has indicated their, their excitement for working as a team to address the impacts and identify the proper level and type of mitigation that's needed. And I think I'm turning it back over to you, Marat. So bring us home. Yes, Mark, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so the understand that there is a quite an interest uh, in where the, the projects goes from here. Uh, and the Army Corps is at a critical point in making that decision on a path forward. And now that the public comments uh, period ended, as well as the comments from you know, the various agencies and the public has been received. And there's naturally a spectrum of alternatives that are being considered from you know, the refining and optimizing the plan and proceeding to the final report. Uh, that is to recover and maintain the original study scope uh, to refining the plan. On the right side, you see developed second draft uh, report with the public outreach while optimi optimizing and then proceeding to the final report. 
Uh, a selection on the left side of the spectrum will mean, you know, compared to the less future federal agency and, and public en engagement as we're going through them right now, uh, with more risk and uncertainty in chief support and recommendations uh, as the scope will be limited uh, as, as opposed to a more comprehensive uh, response. And the selection on the right side, the, the scope is expanded to develop second draft report followed by a 90 day agency and public review uh, and they need additional you know, funding. This will need additional funding and, and, and time of course, to go through this, but there will be less risk and uncertainty in chief reports and recommendations. So it becomes essentially a funding and scheduling question where the next steps takes us. And there will be many opportunities for public and agency enge engagement, as Cliff mentioned in a few slides back during the course of the project. With that, I think we are going into uh, the question session, but I understand, you know, there, there's some questions about the, the, the plan itself. Sarah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it from here then. Yes, Marat, thank you. And thank you all for your presentations. Um, so we had, we had not originally planned to do a deep dive into the technical aspects of the TSP because you know this has been through public comment period for so long. And we want to take advantage of having these folks speak to what those pub public comments look like, because I think is the first time you've actually presented on these um, and been able to digest them a bit. But we, we are prepared for some of those. And so Marat, if you could bring up some of those slides um, that be associated with those um, technical components. I believe Cliff um, is going to speak to them a bit, and they cover the full gamut of, of things, folks. So he will only be able to touch on them briefly in the interest of time. But as Cliff mentioned at the beginning, their website is extremely comprehensive if you want to dive into these deeper. Cliff, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Sarah. And yeah, I see from the comments that uh, there is interest in that. I, I know Marat's bringing up the, the slides. There's, there's a tremendous amount of information in these slides. And I know we're closing in on time, so I, I'm going to let so Marat, if you want to just uh, gl gloss over uh, the slides and, and maybe just key on the highlights. I'm not sure what, what people are actually focused in on because every every detail, uh, whether it's from the Rockaways or Flushing Bay or uh, New Jersey, uh, it, it, it's it, it's a tremendous amount. But I, I'll, I'll let you take it, Mar Marat. And uh, okay. keep, keep the question lines open. So if you have specifics, then maybe we can t tailor it, it on that. Over. You know, Marat, if perhaps yeah. you kind of discuss a little bit about, you know, your nature-based solutions or first line of defense, how you incorporated some of those, then how many gates are there? How many um, storm surge barriers, things like that, flood walls, and just give some, some areas and kind of keep it high level. And then we can direct folks to that website for some more detail. That is true. I think this information is included there. Should be, you know, they should be able to, to find these slides. But this couple of slides shows the main elements of the tentatively selected plan, and it goes through actually each region by region. And and you know, uh, I know it will be hard to see for for folks to to see the details. But I'll, as you said, I'll touch on the main elements here uh, so that they have a feel for what these features include, and then we'll go from there. Right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so this, starting from the, some of the largest elements of the selective plan is the natural the surge barriers, right? So we have two major surge barriers as the, uh, the numerous risk reduction features, uh, some of them, of course, structural, non-structural. And so the two gates include one is the, the kill one cool uh, barrier, right? At the, the northern, uh, east, northeastern tip of the, the Staten Island. Uh, connects and then you'll see some you know uh, renderings on the next slide and the other is the Arthur Kill ba barrier uh, right at the entrance on the southeast corner southwest corner of the Staten Island uh, connecting to the Port Amboy there uh, they're major there of course within the major channels and the navigational access will be impacted there there was you know they, they were considered in the the feasible to level but naturally there's more needs to be done there so those are the two main uh, storm surge barriers that the plan includes. We also have another major one that that I'm going to talk in you know in coming up slides here in a few slides. So let me go to the next slide here so you can see how those uh, storm surge gates renderings looks na naturally. These are two renderings. Up top is the the kill one cool gate. As you can see, there are two sector gates here. Uh, that's in the recess mode right now. There are also lift gates on the, the, the left side to provide more flows into the system. Uh, there's some characteristics that we list here. I don't know if, if people are interested in this. There's about 800 foot opening. Uh, 
That's the crest elevation is about 19. There are five auxiliary gates, lift gates on the right side, as you can see. Uh, and the total length in waters is about 3,300 feet. Uh, and the article at the bottom and left, again, that's a rendering of two islands that's going to be created and connected to shoreline. Uh, that's also navigable above about 600 feet, if not maybe a little bit more. Again, same crest elevation at 19. That it has two auxiliary gates to provide you know, additional flow and total length is about 2,300 feet. So these are the two major storm surge barriers. And going to maybe a little bit more of the details of the features, I know that these, these slides are you know, kind of uh, crowded, but again, you know, please look into the reports and the presentation material that you can see. Uh, these are some selected areas that you can see, for example, the, the Northern New Jersey area, the residual risk features, what we call them. Again, these surge barriers is not going to be closed for you know, smaller surge events. They will be closed on, on larger events, and then when you when they're not closed, there's still risk to these areas, and those risks are covered by the residual risk features, as we call them. They also include different elements, right? The berms, deployable flood wall, uh, uh, barriers, flood walls. There are some nav navigable gates as well in some of these locations, uh, revetments, road raisings, and they have multiple, as you see these dots, they actually identify those protection areas in each one of those areas. If you live in a certain area, and actually the, the store map has a feature that you can put your address to interest area that it will shows you those features in that specific area. On the right in the New Jersey and uh, Staten Island, and some of the features are listed there. Again, similar feature exists in the same area. As you can see on the lower left there is the, the surge barrier at the, uh, the Arthur Kill. On the, the north uh, upper right corner of the image, you'll see the, uh, the Kill One Call again and anything in between. That includes South Shore of Staten Island and some of the projects that are being included there as well as the features that this tentatively the plan includes. I'm not necessarily going to go details and they're listed here. Again, they are different and they all have you know, some tight gates, uh, some barriers, you know, the, the, depending on whether or not they are uh, navigable. Some of them are, some of them are not. Uh, and some of the de details, for example, in the Tottenville, Arthur Kill, Tramley, some of those features are listed there. Uh, going into the next slide here. Uh, well, one of the elements that, you know, interest to, I guess the people might be is, is non-structural elements, whether or not they were considered natural, they're part of the plan. And this image, uh, I think is also part of the plan here uh, or, or the report uh, shows where those non-structural uh, elements of the projects are. And there's, there's a little bit insets here that shows locations in New Jersey, uh, on, you know, on this, the, the, the New Jersey side of Staten Island. And these are all marked uh, with different reaches and a number of structures that I include on the right table there. And it's about 158 whole structures were considered as a non-structural option as part of the alternative three. And those include possible ring walls and non-structural measures. So going into uh, the Coney Islands, you know, this plan of course continues to that area. Uh, again, you know, there are a lot of solutions here, uh, elements of the design. I'm not gonna necessarily go into detail uh, because there's a lot to digest here. But on the left, what you see is an example rendering at the Coney Island boardwalk. Uh, that's the existing conditions uh, right at the boardwalk. And, and then as you can see, uh, the wall being proposed there is, is sort of blending in as part of the, uh, the boardwalk is an elevated platform there. Again, different elements in different areas. There are a lot of projects going on Rockaway right now in the Jamaica Bay area. There are also incorporated into our project. And as you see, a different you know, areas of different uh, measures. And I would recommend folks to again, put their addresses if they are specifically interested in one area to see what kind of solutions that they were, uh, uh, the plan included for those specific areas. Uh, let's see, what's next? So here's the, the Jamaica Bay uh, surge barrier, storm surge barrier that I just mentioned. Uh, the, the one that this is also a rendering, as you can see right behind the bridge there, looking at inside the Jamaica Bay. 
and that naturally that has to connect the high ground and that there's a ring wall goes around here as the other plan showed and here's a ranging of the the wall that goes you know beyond the surge barrier here it's a ranging of initial proposal let's call it this is the existing conditions as you can see the wall is represented here uh, on the same location uh, looking at i believe this is looking at the the bay and the, the from the bay uh, to the ocean side some of the details characteristics of these surge bears also included here there's a two two hundred feet sector gate there there are 15 auxiliary gates and there's a ship uh, ship set bay storm surge barrier too in, in connection with this on the other side it's a smaller gate about 100 feet to it with two auxiliary gates it's about 800 feet uh, there's also a smaller one at the Garrison Creek storm surge barrier. It's again about 100, a little more than 100 feet in length and with two auxiliary gates. And there's, of course, as I mentioned, you know, tines. Uh, total length is about 116,000 feet at this location because you have to find that in this low laying ground, you have to find that high ground to, to connect all the system. Then those include, the measures include within that 16, uh, 116,000 feet uh length is flood walls levees reinforced dunes pedestrian and vehicle gates elevated prom uh, uh, promenades and sea walls and, and tide gates it's a whole system to protect the entire area uh let's see what's next so uh, a little bit more on the, the lower manhattan area and on the left side you see the jersey city and the right side is that the protection elements of the the manhattan area again this project includes some of the existing projects that is being uh, uh, under construction or being built, especially on the, uh, the lower Manhattan area here. And there's also another actual slide that, that I can also share to show what those projects are, if there's an interest. But there's a significant line about 31,000 feet there, you know, again, different measures that include there and going into the, the next one. This shows the Harlem River and some of the protections there. Again, on the left side, existing conditions and rendering of the initial proposal. On the left side, that's at the 106th Street. On the right side, you see examples at the 105th Street, as well as uh, I mean, under the 5th Street, the existing conditions, rendering of the initial proposal, as well as uh, and rendering of the, the during the storm conditions, uh, that how it's look. So there's a pretty much a promenade on the left side, as you can see. And I'm going real fast here. <laughs> For the sake of time here, uh, but you know these are the major elements. And again, Jersey City area that we talked about, uh, total length is about 43,000 feet. The measures again includes flood walls, levees, pedestrian, railroad, and vehicle gates. Number of gates there, elevated promenades and sea walls. Uh, and the York Street, uh, as you can see, is an initial proposal, uh, and it certainly looks like a you know high wall here, uh, but it's made it as a you know promenade on the north side. And of course, there are options to be considered in the next phase. Uh, on the right side is the and a good example of a uh, actually the Liberty State Park, where you have a, a dune system being created on the right side uh, as part of the the plan here. Uh, Newtown Creek area again. There's a gate there. Uh, probably going to skip all the details here, but it's a rendering here that shows how that's going to look. Uh, looking at the the wall front there. Uh, Red Hook in Gowanus Creek, again, rendering there, it's showing how the connections are going to make, you know, these lines shows where those measures are, and then green areas, the green shaded areas, which probably I should have mentioned before, is the potential protection from, from the, the design storm surge level. Uh, going into the Flushing Bay, you can see the promenade on the, the renderings on the right, and again, you see the, the, the dune creation on the right side uh existing conditions versus the, the rendering on the, the site i think this yeah that was the last one hopefully uh that gave a, a short period of time <laughs> yeah that was i know that was very very quick but again no, details are on the website if anyone is interested in especially you know i suggest that you go into the specific area that you know if you like to see in detail 
Yes, for those that this is their first exposure to this, um, you know, as we mentioned, please go to that website. We can put that in the mm -hmm. chat as well from, from Cliff's first slides. And then perhaps, you know, revisit some of those details and then come back and watch this presentation on YouTube to see how um, all of the um, aspects of this TSP have then led to these comments that now are going to be the focus of the, the moving forward point. Um, so we're going to get to um, some questions and answers. Um, one is, were clear flood barriers considered to preserve the views, and do they not function as well as necessary for protection needs? So I, I'll start. Go ahead. Start go, ahead go ahead, Cliff. Uh, yeah, so at, at this time, the, the, um, the designs aren't really uh, looked at in a way to see where, whether they're going to be clear or uh, wh whatever the case may be. The, the functionality is really what we're looking at here. So the concept is to avoid the uh, or minimize the risk of storm surge coming in. Um, how we do that will still be subject to the design uh, as we move forward. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any thoughts on, the, I know there's a lot um, at stake here and, and um, necessary in terms of funding, but are, are there thoughts on what these procurements might look like? Are there going to, there's just a huge area with huge different technical components. Will they be grouped geographically? Will all the gates go under one contract? The nature-based solutions under another? Are there priority areas that you want to get out first? Has any thought been put to that so far? So one of the things that I discussed a little bit early in the presentation is the the um, the intent here for feasibility is to look at everything in a comprehensive way uh, to provide that recommendation so we can move forward um, on the entire project. Um, as we get into the design, once again, um, we can look into what 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 are the easy um, uh, avenues. What what what's the low hanging fruit that we can do first. Or are there are there some um, areas within communities that we can move forward because they are uh, pre pretty hard impacts to those communities? A lot of those discussions still to be had, and we'll continue to work with our partners in New York and New Jersey and New York City um, to see where where we go with prioritizing any areas. Over. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, who's going to be responsible for the land acquisition and environmental cleanup associated with some of those areas? Yeah, so the uh, standard answer becomes uh, our non-federal partner. Um, but to the extent that land acquisition, the real estate, uh, the easements, the lands are going to be part of the project, those would be a, a function of the non-federal partner. So New York, New Jersey, New York City. Um, but some of those costs uh, would be reimbursed because they are project costs. Mm -hmm. the, the extent of the land acquisition needed for cleanup is a different animal. Um, so cleanup would be the responsibility of the non-federal partner. Um, and to the extent that they would have to work with um, the principal uh, responsible parties for, for any cleanup that would be necessary. Uh, we would look to minimize or avoid any areas that require cleanup. Um, but as you know, within New York, New Jersey area, it's hard to avoid certain areas. So if we're gonna look to provide the protection, we're gonna have to find a way. And a lot of that, again, will, will become some of the refinements in design uh, if we can, in, in fact, avoid or minimize certain areas. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that one of the uh, comments or many of the comments that you've received were with regard to not enough nature-based solutions being incorporated. But I also know that the Army Corps has other projects ongoing that are nature-based solution within this area. So how is that informing some of, some of your process, for instance, the Hudson Raritan projects or, or even the ones that are outside of Army Corps' um, purview, like the EDC and the DDC doing things all along um, Battery Park and um, Lower Manhattan? Yeah, and that's a great question. And we know we get that a lot. Um, a lot of what we've been doing to this point in time has been trying to figure out the, the large pieces, the, the, uh, the, the elements that would provide that protection to an, to an event like uh, Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, and once we have that in place, we've kind of penciled in where we could have uh, national and nation-based features, where we could have non-structural, where we would have those risk reduction features 
uh, even in the case where the barrier was was open. Um, so there's a lot of refinements still to be done on where those could be placed, but there definitely is um, emphasis to make sure that we are building those in as part of the project. We see those more as, I'll say, complementary features, uh, but not necessarily standalone features, because uh, they they have the ability to reduce the the uh, impacts in certain areas, but usually they their impact is reducing the the risk to some of the lower le level flooding um, um, in, in areas, as opposed to the higher events like Hurricane Sandy. Um, so definitely more more to be uh, considered in that. And now now that we have a um, supposedly, if we have a tentatively selected plan, we can focus our attention on where where and how to build those in. A um, couple other questions. Many of the single basin barriers in 3B contain sluice gates and other features in the presented preliminary designs that could drastically limit flow. Any thoughts on looking towards systems like the Thames River barrier that have a lower form factor? Uh, it, it's, Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm actually uh, heading there to London to uh, to take a tour of the Thames River gates. Um, I'll ask Cliff to to elaborate on 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 the selection of them, but they have been shown to be very effective, uh, closing I think uh, well over a hundred times since their opening uh, back in the early '80s, and uh, they could be a possible uh, potential application. But Kurt, uh, sorry, Cliff, maybe you uh, would like to tackle the rest of that. Yeah, I, actually, I was going to look to Murat. Uh, you want to add anything on more on that? <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. I know what type of sluice gate that they're referring to, but we do have lift gates. And, you know, when we consider these these uh, elements way back in, it goes back to the feasible, the pre-feasibility level, that, you know, circulation certainly is an important element. And the lift gates that, that I talked about beyond the surge opening itself is certainly a significant element of the whole system. And... You know, when we look at these, you know, model, the, the way we understand the circulation, the impact is to model. And, you know, currently where it stands now, we do have the modeling results and we're looking at the, the impacts from that perspective. Uh, but, you know, whatever it's being designed there or completed there will have the, 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 the circula enough circulation to minimize any impacts that might have during the, uh, for the environmental uh, questions or concerns there. So again, it's being considered the lift gates are out there already. And maybe some of those types could be changed depending on how we really uh, get into the final design, but it's very early stages right now to get into that, that much of a detail at this moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question here, what are the two or three most assessed effective nature-based solutions in the plan? Which I, I think that might be challenging to answer because it's very location specific, but is there any answer that you all are willing to provide for that? Um, I, would, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to mention uh, you know, my experience with living shorelines, as Cliff mentioned, um, they are really mostly effective in uh, lower uh, water leveled areas where you have shallower water depths and you have uh, you know, your, the ability to um, manage the amount of material and, and you know, the assets that you're trying to protect um, and uh, accept a certain level of of a of flooding, um, they they are effective at low, uh, high frequency flood uh, events. But as Her as Cliff mentioned, the larger, higher uh, storm surges um, have a you know they they have a limited um, ability to be effective. Um, so uh, you know there's a lot of talk you know discussion about mitigation as well, and there certainly could be areas of wetland restoration that are identified in the Hudson Router Estuary uh, program that could be used as um, basically sponges in certain areas to help absorb uh, surge amounts and, and pr uh, protect infrastructure. Yeah, and I was just going to add, so, I mean, right now in the process, so with, with the draft report, and like I said earlier, we haven't really defined what those would be. We kind of put lines on a map of where they might be included to complement the, uh, the project that we have as tentatively selected plan. So there's a lot of work still to follow. We are using our uh, research and development team uh, within the Army Corps of Engineers to help us out. 
Um, there's an engineering with nature program that they have um, that, that is worldwide that, that, that they try to understand better the systems that could be used. And like Mark said, wh whether the living shorelines, uh, marsh, um, uh, uh, um, oyster reefs, I mean, all of those contribute to, to a certain extent. So all of them are, are still on the table and we'll try to refine that as we move forward, getting into a final report. And just to assure everybody, I guess, from for what to add to what Cliff said, in you know, one of our uh, initial tasks going forward is we were asked to start looking at the opportunities of the NMBFs, as well as not only NMBFs, nat natural nature-based solutions, but also non-structural solutions as well. So that's one of our low-hanging fruits, you know, as we receive these comments and there's significant interest in there. Our next step is immediately start looking for those opportunities wherever we can. So that that's sort of the next step in our you know path forward that I talked about. Great. Um, another question that I have, and we mentioned briefly these non-federal sponsors. So we have the City of New York, New Jersey DEP, and New York State DEC. We talked a bit about their responsibility with land acquisition, environmental cleanup, but what other what other role are they playing in in these plans, in the decisions about what is chosen, and in actually implementing this plan? And could there be other non-federal sponsors or is that it? The ones that are signed up now, those are the ones that are at the table. Yeah, so ba basically we signed into an agreement with them um, mm -hmm. to move forward on this study in a way to make sure that it keeps the process going, it keeps uh, the momentum moving, it gets the information out and they they are the ones that are on our team. Uh, so they, they are definitely contributing with us to make sure that we move this forward. I mean, we meet with them every week um, to make sure that we're, we're doing the right things and uh, moving this uh, in, in the right direction. We're coordinating with them all of this uh, public involvement that we've been doing. They've been with us uh, lockstep um, and they've been helping us as well to identify certain areas uh, that we, we should be having these public meetings uh, at. Um, so we've been looking to use them uh, to, to get to that point, uh, making sure that we're doing their outreach correctly. And, and we're definitely looking to use them in a way um, in reviewing reports before they go public. Uh, so they do get a chance to see what's out there uh, before it lands in the public hands. Uh, but they as well have the opportunity to comment the same way as we, our, our own agency is commenting the same time that this report goes public and to all of the other agencies. Very good. Um, another question that is with regards to the operation, and I know I think Marat, it was used one of those the very last comments you had there was, are these actually going to be operated and maintained? Because it's it's far out from where we are right now of actually having these installed. So has there been any conversation around who would operate these? You have them within multi-states, cross jurisdiction, who has the capabilities to operate something of this nature? Is it a whole new entity to this forum? Um, and I know all of this is speculative, but has their conversation been around um, how that would be done? You want to take that, Marat? Sure, I'll take it. Great, great question, right? So again, there are a lot of conversations naturally on that. You know, uh, the operation maintenance certainly, and how how you know the, the operation starts, and then you know maintain the whole the maintenance of the system. You know, there are examples around the world, right? There are you know Dutch has their own entity who mm -hmm. literally manages you know the operations as well as the maintenance of these gates. And I think that's still in being considered right now. I, I don't think it has been decided yet, <laughs> uh, but it's not that it's omitted, it's part of the discussion. Uh, I don't know if it, I will get there, maybe it will. Uh, my personal view, of course, this is not the Army Corps or anybody's, uh, but certainly needs to be considered. You know, We are talking about it, we are thinking about it. It's part of the discussion here, uh, but how that's gonna happen is, is probably has to happen in the next, next phase here. I don't think there is a set answer at the moment, but very important questions. Again, two things, right? One is when do you operate these gates? When do you start to close them? Because it will impact everywhere. And then, you know, follow up to that is, is how do you uh, maintain those those gates in the, into the future? Because these are naturally very, very large structures yes. uh, and are going to cost a lot of uh, money and then a lot of time to build as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's complicated by the fact that the, some of the gates are by state. So yes. they, they span New York and New Jersey. So you, you have that aspect of it. And uh, there's, you know, currently only the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has that ability to manage the assets across uh, 
across both states. Um, but, you know, like, like Murat said, it could be an independent agency or could be some other type of entity that has a ability to work across state lines. Yeah, and just adding as well. So um, everything that we do, we have to take uh, into account the cost of whatever it is. So there is a cost that is associated with the O&M of whatever it is that we're going to do. Everything is conceptual, but there, there would be that maintenance cost that's expected uh, by whoever it is that does it. And then, like Murat said, I mean, yes, during the course of this probably won't be answered, but it is being discussed. As we get further into design, there's going to be a need for an actual operation and maintenance manual that we would prepare and give that to somebody uh, with the expectation, this is how you're going to uh, manage it in the future. That's going to be one big document, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. <likely. laughs> Hopefully not, not as large as this report. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, we have a couple of more. We are getting close to the end of our time, but we do have a couple more. So since many cities are looking at removing barriers of access to shorelines, how is desirability of communities and neighborhoods factored into NEPA and project review process? Um, I'll just suggest that the public comment period was uh, very important in reaching out to uh, communities and understanding what their desired outcomes of the HAT study would be. Um, there are trade-offs associated with flood resiliency, as we as we know, and um, I, th I think you know what New York City has done here in Manhattan with uh, access along the promenades, along with step downs, with uh, uh, you know abilities to be able to reach the water. I live in a community that does have a large flood wall. Uh, it's uh, uh, six miles long, and there are access uh, points where individuals can walk uh, up a set of stairs and, and access the beach and enjoy the ocean. Um, but if, if, if it's desirable to um, you know, be able to accept a certain amount of risk in that community, that's a, that's a decision. I've, uh, been, I've led workshops where stakeholders have gotten involved and they've identified what uh, level of risk they're willing to tolerate and then what are the measures and treatments that are available to them in order to prevent, provide some flood resiliency but still provide the, uh, the site access that they desire. It's really a, it's a trade-off discussion and that, that um, you know, we really need to all kind of work together as a team uh, in order to identify the, the community's uh, goals and that they feel like that they're that they're that they're uh, they're being listened to and that they're, they're the proper treatments are being applied to their to their community. Absolutely. Um, one other question then: in the public engagement process, is there deliberate feedback to the public on major significant concerns or issues which cannot be addressed? or included in the plan for some compelling reason or limitation? And you might not even be there yet as you're still kind of compiling all these comments. And I think at the end of the day, you know, everyone's gonna be slightly displeased and slightly happy, right? That's how you know you've come up with the right solution with something here, but do, do you have um, any other feedback you wanna provide with that question? So I, I don't know if it gets exactly to the question, but um, our, we, we have a couple of things and that, that's what Marat was saying a little bit earlier as to the pathways we go from here, um, it, it may be one, whatever pathway that we choose, it's gonna be one where we have some sort of information that goes back to all of the comments that we received, um, responses to those comments and how we address in those comments, whether or not it's by our website or some sort of um, mechanism so people can see, or whether it's a second draft report uh, that goes out so people can see how their comments were incorporated. But our intent definitely is, as you, you might see on the, on the website, there's a lot of information on the website. Our intent is to use that to the maximum extent we can uh, to make sure that people understand and feel that they were heard. What I can add is, is you know, well said, Cliff. I guess this is the process, right? This is the process that we are going through. And I, I think if I understand the question correctly, uh, that Without knowing what those comments are, it's hard to tell, right, what it can and what cannot be included. I think this is the process. So we know what those are now, as Cliff said it, and they are being considered, every one of them is being considered. And, you know, I think that will determine, the next phase will determine what of those 
you know, to the maximum extent as glyphs that it can be can be incorporated. Maybe that will be the time to understand, you know, but maybe a full answer to that question. But hopefully, this will satisfy right now where we asked it. Our right, final topic. question and a, a slightly off topic, but um, we're at the beginning of this process. This is a very long time before these gates are built and these nature-based solutions, et cetera. So in the meantime, Cliff, there's a question for you. What is the Corps doing to work with the state and the city for hurricane preparedness? Great question. Um, so when we look at hurricanes in the future, storms in the future, and, and any sort of flood uh, risk in the future, uh, we do look at certain uh, different aspects of it. So with the HAT study, we're looking at that more comprehensive um, structural, if you will, uh, how do we reduce the risk of, of flooding? Um, but there is also the aspect of how do we prepare people to get out of harm's way? And that's one, one of the things that the state just uh, came out last week and their hurricane evacuation study is going to get more into that making sure that they have evacuation plans. And we're going to be working with the state and the city on that uh, as they move forward. They, they're redoing that uh, for the first time in about 15 years. So it's going to be a huge effort for them, understanding the, the new developments, the new risks uh, that, that have been exposed. And uh, as well, uh, the city and the state are also grappling with um, the, the other areas kind of in between. Uh, how, how do they manage the, the stormwater? Uh, the, 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 the combined sewage, um, all of the things that add to uh, that, that flood risk uh, in there. And we, we still stay connected with them, uh, with their emergency operations folks, uh, Homeland Security and, and the rest, to make sure that we have one comprehensive plan. Kind of fits into yet another question uh, that might be out there. Um, uh, addressing and assessing all of the efforts that the, the states, the cities, the communities are doing on their own uh, to provide their own resiliency. And we try to incorporate all of that into what we're doing here in HATS. So we do have a full picture of the whole solutions that, that are going on, on out there. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for your time today. I know there is a lot of work ahead of you and I appreciate you all coming here to talk about um, where you've been and, and where you plan on going. And, um, and for everyone again, that link to this study is in the chat. Um, so please make sure you go there. It is incredibly comprehensive. And a lot of the public presentations that have been done over these 175 days, I think you said, Cliff, are there. So you can watch those as well as people dive into um, a little more depth into some of these technical components. And then always come back here um, on the YouTube site that will have this presentation and maybe watch it a second time after being informed there. So thank you again very much to all of you. I really appreciate your time today. Sarah, thank we you, appreciate Sarah. being here. Thank you, guys. And Medea, over Thank to you. you for closing. Yep, thanks for the Thank opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yes. Thanks for joining us. And I think I put, I covered all the CEU information and I put it in the chat. So just look for the survey from me if you need PDH credits or if you need to give me your AIA or GBCI number. And thank you again for joining us. And we'll be putting this online for you. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you very much. Bye, all. Bye, everybody. Bye.